Hey, 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 everybody. It is I Hope Giselle Hope Disguised, and I'm coming at you all with another episode of Can We Talk? And this episode is like low key special because this was one of my friends that I absolutely adore. Uh, I really appreciate his opinions about a bunch of things, um, whether he knows it or not. Uh, he like gets me nuck and buck and ready to fight, and then also brings me back down into like my logical sense of self and who I'm supposed to be as a person, while also educating me and elevating me as a black woman. And so it is really dope that um, he is stopping through. Now, for all of you all who don't know how you know can we talk works, I think that it's important for me to remind people that these are conversations with real people. I know that a lot of the conversations that I've had before have included celebrities and a lot of folks really like the idea of us keeping these things conversational. And so that's what we're going to do here. Everything here is candid. All of these topics and things that we talk about are me talking about these things with friends. I want y'all to be flies on the wall. I don't want these things to come off as interviews. So if you are watching or if you're listening and you have questions, feel free to you know submit them later or feel free to uh, comment about them below in the comment sections, either on the podcast or on the YouTube. But without further ado, I want to introduce you all to my good friend, Mr. Nicholas Gaines. Hey. Like, what's going on? Hey girl, hey girl, I'm good. How are you? Happy Friday. Uh, oh, I forgot it was Friday. Today is Friday. <laughs> I, I forgot it was Friday. I, look here, this week has been a toughie. Uh, this week has been a toughie. The last two weeks have been, been this is definitely and I all of my days have run together even more than usual. So yeah. I'm just excited to have you on because I'm not I'm not even sure how to properly title you. Like give the people a rundown of all of the things that you're amazing. <laughs> thank you. First of all, thank you for for thinking enough of me to have me on your show. I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity because you know I love you. So uh, I am an educator and a pastoral psychotherapist. Uh, I am a facilitator and a dad. So, um, and I guess I would throw activists in there too, because we've been doing that work since forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First of all, I think that that's why I want to start. I want to start with the dad piece. Like the dad piece is, is the piece that I think we all, my favorite little cousins. <laughs> <laughs> little E cousins. <laughs> my favorite little E cousins. They are yeah. just everything. They are like, they are the night. I've only met them once in person, y'all. And True is a little shady. True, yeah. true. true shady. He's my firecracker. You know, King is the oldest one. He's my. He's the shady one because he he's very much kind of me. He's like quiet, <laughs> he'll shady, and then he'll sit there. You know, okay. man of the English language. And then True just you know he says what he thinks immediately. So <laughs> I just I, I love it, and I think that for me, I wanted to kind of just jump in on, on that topic and talk about what it's like being a black father and then i think the piece of, of the pie that makes it a little bit more relevant to the conversation because people are like oh well there are black fathers all the time mm -hmm. but what a lot of folks don't know from just looking at you or wouldn't be able to assume by just looking at you most of the time is that you are a man who is openly bisexual mm -hmm. so you are black you're openly mm -hmm. bisexual and yeah. your fatherhood means a lot to you it does so can we dig into that let's talk yeah let's talk about it um yeah so when we think about fatherhood in the black community, a lot, oftentimes we think about the most toxic style of man, mm. then regenerating that toxic style of man, especially right. when they have sons. Mm -hmm. And so how, do you, how have you found it, um, or have you found any opposition from other black men um, upon discovering your sexuality or upon uh, discovering even like your adjacency to the community in, in certain spaces when you don't deem it necessary to, to disclose your sexuality. How have you found uh, other black men or black people in general uh, receiving of that while also being or recognizing that you are a father of two boys? That's a great question. You know, I think a lot of times kind of as you mentioned before, um, I think there's some privileges that I have uh, maybe being uh, what people would perceive as straight passing. Uh -huh. And so people don't really know until they get to know me as a person, right? And I think that it's been really helpful for me actually in navigating the world to kind of have that because people don't assume. And then suddenly when I come out and talk about being queer and what that means to me, because for me, you know, my sexuality is more than who I sleep with, right? It's the way that it's the way that energies connect. It's the way that I think it's my politics. It's like all of that. And so that is, I think, been really infused with how I show up as a dad. Um, I think that all of us in some way can talk about the ways that our parents could have showed up differently for us, 
right? Yeah. Or showed up more, right? Loved us, been more tender, been more nurturing. And I think as 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 uh, people are part of the community, LGBTQIA+, we might have had even more traumatic experiences with our dads um, because there's this idea around like, when you raise a kid, you have to raise them this specific way. And if you don't raise them this way, you're not raising them well. And so I think about being a queer a queer man myself, I think about the ways that I was raised and how so much of my interaction with the adults around me was about the policing of like my masculinity. Mm-hmm. And it was about the performance of it then, right? Because it's like, I know that if I perform it in this particular way, then I'm going to be treated this way. But if I'm maybe this particular way, I'm not going to be. And so a lot of me being a dad has been like giving my sons what I didn't have, but also giving them what they need. And a lot of that is my biggest, I think, thing has been around like centering their personhood. Like you get to be exactly who you are without me trying to mold you. I don't want you to be more masculine or whatever. Like if you want to sit with your legs crossed, do that. If you want to run around the house with a high pitched voice, do that. You know, because I, I feel like in so many ways, we traumatize our kids by expecting them to perform in a certain way. And that performance is for us, it's never for them. And the last thing that I wanna do is relegate my kids to more trauma when they get older because I didn't work through my own trauma as a black man that I just then projected on them, you know? That to me is so, it it resonates especially because as a black trans woman who was socialized as a, a black gay man at first, there were a lot of things that I could not do before I even realized that I guess at least in the black community, they were strongly frowned upon. Yeah. Things like crossing my legs, even though I got the whole idea of wanting to cross my legs from watching older black men. Um, Cause I, I'm sure like, as we all have seen like in the, in the, in our communities, at a certain age, a lot of black men, like as they play dominoes, like they cross their legs or, you know, things like that. And so I thought that I was being cool, like the older guys. Right. Um, and realize that at a certain age, your masculinity has sort of been sealed. And so there's not a policing of it at that point. Um, but I couldn't do the this, you know, we all have got trouble for this. <laughs> yes. And I, I couldn't do all of those things and I couldn't like pink, even though I associated with it for various reasons very early on before realizing the association with femininity that it had. Um, there were just so many things that I was policed on and I did not understand until I got to grade school. Mm-hmm. And so I think that is one important and pivotal that you are instilling in your boys that they can be exactly who it is that they want to be and how that shows up naturally for them. Yeah. While also, you know, holding true to the values of what is right and wrong, right? Yeah. Yeah. On the idea of still grooming children because a lot of people think that, especially when they're being raised by queer parents, mm-hmm. that our goal is to steer them or have an agenda, you right. know? Right, right. It, it, it's ridiculous. And I think, you know, as you talked about the policing, you know, and to going into elementary school, I don't think that our parents, I don't think that my my parents, my stepdad specifically, um, and I have I have two dads. I have my biological dad and my stepdad. Um, I don't think that my stepdad raised me with the intention to be brutal or to be harmful to me. Mm-hmm. I don't think that he woke up like, I'm gonna be harmful to this little nigga, you know? Like, I don't think that, that was his intention. As you talked about going into elementary school and a lot of the policing beforehand, I do think that a lot of times cishet parents will try to socialize and police the performance of their sons so that when they get into school, they're going to be picked on less, that they're going to be able to act as if they're this way so that they can be maybe sealed from more harm later. And I don't think that people have the sense of self or even the knowledge to know that, like, actually, it's the opposite, right? Like, kids are going to be kids and kids are resilient, but they're going to be, I think the way that we speak to our kids, like me as a dad, the thing I always think about is, like, the way that I speak to my sons becomes their inner voice. Mm. So how I speak to them, the tone I speak to them, the things I say about them becomes the things that they think in their head as they get older. So I think a lot of my undoing of the policing that was done to me had to be turning down the voices of you don't sit like that, you don't talk like that, you don't dress like that, you don't walk like that, right? You can't like this thing, you can't, you can't, you know, read Essence Magazine or whatever it was as a kid was undoing all those voices. So I could be like, actually, I like this, I like Mm. this, and I'm going to do this without Mm. judging in my head. So I think a lot of parenting is like, you get to really help determine what that inner voice is for your babies. And I wanna be 
that that role for me is sacred. Mm. You know, I never thought about it like that, um, and especially when you place it in in that mind frame, because it, it goes back to those things where it's like. We all have those moments, and especially queer kids, yes. we all have those moments with our parents where there's something that is extremely fucked up that they've done, mm -hmm. and we remember it to the letter. Yes. And later on in life, when we get to a point where we're willing to unpack it with them, they're like, that never happened. I would never do that to you. Mm -hmm. We all have one of those. We all stories. have those stories, yes. We all yes. have one of those stories where yes. they're like, I would never. I, what, what are you talking about? But essentially in those moments, those are the moments that become your, our heads. They are cemented yeah. and those moments become that voice that you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where it's just like, I remember having that moment. I, I recall this story all the time where my mom was just like, if you come home as, as anything other than my son, mm -hmm. I don't know you. Mm -hmm. I will not come to the funeral. Mm -hmm. And to this day, she will never admit that she said that. Mm -hmm. She'll never admit that she said anything like that, but that's one of my inner voices. And that was part of the reason why I think I didn't identify with my transness sooner, mostly mm -hmm. because it, we didn't have the knowledge that we have now. And so I, right. didn't, know, I didn't know what she was talking about. I was right. like, what do you mean? I, I have the option to do that? Yeah. But then also I felt like, okay, I'm only like 10 years old. My mommy is my best friend. And if my mommy <laughs> says that I can't do this- I'm not gonna do it. I'm not going to do this. And even as a 16, 17 year old who is now formulating my own opinions in a, in a, in a more concrete way, it was still one of those things where I was like, but my mommy is not going to like me if I do this. Listen, it hits a chord with me when you talk that, when you say that, right? Because I grew up, um, my mom was a pastor. Mm. And so as I think about that, uh, in this conversation, I think about the fact, and again, I don't ever think that my parents specifically were like, we're going to be harmful, right? Right. I think that, and I say this to ground the conversation, right? I think that a lot of times our parents, especially Black parents, uh, people of color, they are coming through, as, as the problematic J. Cole says, long lines of trauma, right? And they never had the opportunity or the language to address it. Right. So the 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 way that our culture runs is like fix it now. But we we're grown now. So they might be fixing and working on being their best and highest self now. But who they were then is not who they are now. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that that distance. But I think about my mom being a pastor and I think about the traumas that my mom experienced as a kid and the ways that faith and religion was a comfort for her. She she held so tightly to that. And I think because we dealt with so much and lived through so much, that was something that she was trying to give me because we didn't have money. We were poor, right? So she was trying to give me faith in God that like, you're going to be okay. The underbelly of that is that so much of our faith was performative, right? Uh, for me, I can't speak for her, but for me, it was performative. Like I have to be this way. I have to act this way. And so I got the message very early that my worthiness was contingent on who I worshiped, how I acted, the way that I showed up in the world. And it wasn't contingent on the fact that I'm here. Like, because I'm here, I'm worthy. Because I'm here, I'm deserving of love. And so I think a lot of the ways that I showed up as a kid was trying to perform to be more loved, to be deemed more worthy. And I think that that, for me, was probably one of the most toxic things that I learned as a kid, you know, that my worthiness was contingent on the way that I showed up and how I earned it. And so I think I went through my whole, you know, all the way through my 30s trying to be like, I'm worthy because I have to earn this. Not that, not knowing intrinsically that I'm like deserving and worthy of good things just because I'm here. Mm, definitely. I think that we've all, going back into, especially black, not even black queer children, but like I think black children as a whole, we all have those moments of, I'm doing this to make my people happy. Yes. And we see it a lot, especially within um, like African cultures, where mm -hmm. we hear a lot of them say, "I have to become a doctor," you know, like I, yeah, because yeah. that's that's what this American dream that's been fed onto a lot of African people in those cultures. Um, you know, you're gonna go to America, you're gonna go to school, you're gonna go to Ivy League schools, you're gonna be a doctor, and you're gonna be better than us. Totally. And anything short of that is mm -hmm. failure. Yeah. You could come over here and become, you know, Timberland. Yes. Right? And that still would not matter because you are not a doctor. Right. <laughs> you know? And I think that the mistake in that, that our parents maybe unknowingly walk into is the fact that it teaches us 
that in order to be worthy, to be accepted, right, mm -hmm. is that you have to pine for love. And so go with me in this, that like you grow up performing to get love. And then we take that idea of performance for love and pining for love that we will almost do anything for recognition, affirmation, validation, even personhood. We take that with us into our careers, right? So we settle for stuff that maybe we shouldn't do. We let bosses talk to us in ways that are crazy. We stay at companies that have cultures that don't align with who we are intrinsically. We are in relationships in which we will dehumanize ourselves sometimes, right? Or we will be treated poorly because it's like, I have to do this to demonstrate my love for this person or to be loved in return. And so it damages us the way that we are, um, the way that we grow up and the way that the ideas of masculinity and love and, and, and personhood are constructed. You know, we grow up pining for love and then we take that to work. We take that with our friends. We take that into our love. Right, we take that into our interest as like I can't even rest because I have to earn this rest that I'm about to have. I got to clean the whole house before I sit down. Mm. And when we talk about the ways in which, like, there there's this expectation that before I can be happy, I have to ensure that everybody else around me is happy. Yes, yes. There there there's this expectation that before I can finally lay my head on this pillow, everybody yes. has had to eat. Yeah. Everybody has had to have their beds tucked in. I have to clean every bathroom in here. Everything has to be spotless and put away. Before and the then, yes. and only then right. am I allowed to lay down, only to be expected to do it again. Every day. Every day. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that that's like, that to me is crazy, but it's also a really great segue into one of the other things that I truly value your opinions on. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday where I was just like, you don't know it, but like your Insta stories are like hella feminist approved. Like they are so dope. <laughs> I mean, like there are some days where if I didn't know who I was following, I would think that you were a black woman scorned. Wow. That was just like, yeah. okay. I'm, I'm coming out of this and I'm, I'm about to level up. Like yeah. it was so encouraging the things that you post sometimes. Um, and especially as it relates to black women or women in general and our sexual liberation. Mm -hmm. There is something to be said about the ways in which we as black women have learned to settle for yes. shitty experiences that involve sex or shitty experiences that involve intimacy as a whole. Yeah. And while some of those things are memes that you obviously agree with, mm -hmm. a lot of those thoughts are your own. Yeah. And for me to see a man um, who won, because it is very multifaceted for me, to see a bisexual man who is still very in tune with the idea of when I do engage with women, this is the type of experience that I've noticed that they are not having. Mm -hmm. And so I seek to do the opposite of that, but I also seek to hold my other brothers who are also engaging with women accountable for the fact that I'm noticing this yeah. and I'm calling you all in to notice it with me. Yes. And and, and that to me is so pivotal. So I think that um, the, the question about this one is what, what drove you? Like, what was the experience that led you say like, God, y'all are really out here having bad sex. <laughs> Um, so I mentioned earlier when you were like, what do you do? Um, I talked about being a pastoral psychotherapist. And what I mean by that is, so I went, I went to, uh, my, my, my career <laughs> experiences. I spent, um, seven years as an army chaplain, which means that I was in, responsible for spiritual care to soldiers and their families, spiritual and emotional care to soldiers and their families. A part of that job was also the army sent me to school to learn, um, behavioral health, veteran behavioral health. So how veterans think and process trauma and deal with trauma and things like that. So over 10 years of my career was spent giving people therapy, right? And a lot of the work that I did was around relationships and family. And a lot of the work that I did was dealing with families who had encountered, you know, combat and separations because of deployments and assignments and stuff like that. And a lot of the work that I did, I would find that depending on the, the situation in secular, when I mean by secular is like people who were not religious or church relationships, um, there was a big influence of patriarchy in ways that were damaging and harmful to women, right? What I found in situations where people came from Christian environments, it was the same thing, the same patriarchy, but we were then using faith instead of a tool of liberation, we were using it as a tool of oppression. 
And, you know, I remember having a counseling session with a couple, this is a long answer to your question, but it's the, the truth. I remember having a counseling session with a couple and this woman wanted to do these sexual things with her husband. But the only way that he liked sex was this one particular position. So for 13 years of their marriage, she would only perform sex doggy style for her husband. Okay. There's more. And so she, so she only would perform sex doggy style for her husband, but then because they were Lutheran, a part of her theology being an evangelical was that her husband was the, the head of the household. Right. And so him being the head of the household, he got to determine what was what. And so she actually wanted to um, like ride him like cowgirl style. But because of their theology, she could not exercise dominance over her husband. She learned this in church. And so the reason that they were talking to me was to try to figure out like, what is a compromise so that both people could be happy? And I think that a lot of times the couples that I would talk to, sexual dysfunction and intimacy uh, issues were huge. And so I would see that and I'm like, so you mean to tell me like, we're having this whole conversation centering your pleasure, but we never asked her like, what does she desire? What she wants, what she needs, what she's scared of? And I would see time and time again that the answer was no. Mm. And it was largely for a lot of white people, right? I think then it moved to working with, with communities of color and realizing that we take a lot of the same stuff, right? And I think for black women in my experience in counseling was that they felt like they had to be Beyonce. They had to do all the, tri the, the you know, in partition where she's doing all the dances and the hair yeah. and the, the yeah. costume. I mean, like, yeah. black women felt like they had to look and be a certain way just to be perceived as sexy and then desired. Yes. And because of that, I, yeah. I think as a black man, I feel like, obviously I'm not an expert on what it means to be a woman because that's not my experience, but I do know the experiences I've had lend me to think differently about how I show up as a partner to who I'm with you know, to be able to center them and their personhood and their desires include and center my own, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, when I lead men and masculine folk into the conversation, it's like, yo, we've been trained our whole life to basically look at women like we would view them on Pornhub. And though Pornhub is a thing and porn is exciting and porn can be helpful, porn is performance. Mm -hmm. you're talking, you're, you are interacting with a person who has a body, a mind, a soul, and a spirit. And when, for me, sex is about connecting to all of that. So like, how can I help you think differently about how you interact with this being so that y'all can both have pleasure, so that you can both enjoy this experience and that you can center your partner's pleasure too? There is a lot there. <laughs> there is a lot there. And a lot of it is because I just had that, that very same conversation with a girlfriend of mine um, and actually uh, an ex-partner of mine. Mm -hmm. I feel like, especially for black women and women of, well, no, black women, because mm -hmm. there's, there's, a, there's an exoticism to women of color, mm -hmm. right? And that's why we have to be very careful on certain topics when we link totally. with that. But there's not this exoticism to black women. And so, yes, a lot of us do go into the bedroom feeling like I got to show up like Beyonce in that one video that you don't watch 50,000 times. And I know you don't know the words to the song, so I know why you watching it. Right. And it's just like, the sad part about it is we as black women, a lot of the time see black men do the drape, hair to pants, uh, you know, sweat pants, hair tie, you know, makeup on, you know, but Rick was talking about black women when he says sweat pants, hair tie, chilling with no makeup on. You're right. <laughs> he wasn't talking about black women when he said that. He was talking about the curly haired, ambiguous women. Mm -hmm. He was talking about the Latinx women. He was talking about the girls that are black but don't necessarily look black or they got just enough tan to be a Kardashian without mm -hmm. the actual spray. And black women know that. Yeah. And so in the bedroom, there's this need or this feel to one overperform mm -hmm. because we don't feel like we're just naturally beautiful walking into the room. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I can have on my Monday panties and get you risen, right? Mm -hmm. And so I go to Victoria's Secret and I spend all of my money on this thing that you're not gonna pay attention to. Mm -hmm. You might like look up at it and, and the color catches your eye, but it's not. It's not me in it. It's yes. oh, that was red and you yeah. came in the room. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. And I think that for a lot of us, there is this 
need to overperform, and then there is always this next mm -hmm. because as I'm overperforming, my performance is usually seen as too much. My performance is usually cut short. Mm -hmm. My performance is not respected. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we see these racially ambiguous, light skin, you know, bright skin black women, they will be up here doing flips and tricks from the ceiling and have you waiting for 30 minutes and you'll watch every minute of it. Mm -hmm. But it's like, as a black woman, I come in here after I put in all of this workout and got my hair done, knowing that you're about to mess it up. Yes. And, <laughs> and I mean, the green says sweat it out. He did. Right. Sweat it out. So you can get it done oh, again. Oh, yeah. You about to sweat my whole weave out that I spent all of my money. I'm I'm looking all great and all of this and that. You're about to rip this a hundred and something dollar agent provocateur yes. that I just bought. Yes. And yeah. <laughs> just I mean, there's yeah. no respect for what I want in this space. There's no respect for why I'm doing this, or yeah. is there an occasion? Like there, there's no actual reciprocation of the fact that I've gone out of my way to ensure that, that this is gonna happen. Because then when the actual intercourse starts, it is about you getting your dicks up, you putting it in the right places, me positioning myself in order to make you come. And then if I don't, it's just like, well, you did this for me. This was a, this was my gift. So I mean, I shouldn't have to, you good, I'm good. Right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And we learn to accept that as black women. Ooh, Jesus. And I think what what what's hurtful about that and listening to that is the ways that you do all of that naked. Mm. Like you are in your most vulnerable place and you show up body, soul, mind, and spirit to connect with another human being, to give it your all, right? Mm. And it not only is it not reciprocated, it's not recognized, but it's not even valued. Mm. And so again, that for me, exacerbates my work in trying to help black men and masculine folk understand that like we gotta do better because not only are you deserving of more, but you are worthy of more, period. You have to feel like that. Period. We, but that's, I think that the biggest issue with that is that black women have to start feeling like that. And I think that a lot of us are waiting for black men to help us feel that way. Mm -hmm. There, there's, there's so much, there's only so much that we can do. Like last night I posted a status that just said, I am not every woman. It is not all in me. Right. And I just, sometimes I just want to hug. Sometimes I just want to be kissed and I want to feel loved. And I think that while there are a lot of black men performing mm -hmm. love for black women, there are not a, a lot of men who are actively loving black men in the ways that they show up on the internet. There are not a lot of black men who are actively attracted. Like, I, and I think that, that that's the thing that people fail to realize is that you can, you can see beauty, but beauty and attraction are two different things, right? There are plenty of black men that think that black women are beautiful, mm -hmm. but are you attracted to black women? Mm -hmm. Do they get, do they get a rise out of you? Is there something about us that does to you, what it does to you when you see that Latina girl, that it does to you when you see that Indian woman, that it does to you when you see that tiny Asian woman, because yeah. there is a lustful, like a you know, there, there, yeah. there's a lustful thing that comes over black men when they see women of other races. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, what's often mistaken for that same feeling is the way that black women's bodies are disrespected. Mm -hmm. Because that 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 lust that black men that we see black men see for other races of women right. isn't disrespectful. It is it's it's admiration. It's mm -hmm. oh my god, like oh bro, do you see that? Like oh my god, them Brazilian women is just so da 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 da. da. Right. But when it when it when it pertains to us, a lot of people like to say, "Well, I give you that energy." No, you give me disrespect. Mm -hmm. Because it's oh look at them titties and look at that da 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 da, da look at them thighs. It's, it's it's not the same recognition of my culture and my heritage, right? And it's also me as a human being that you're recognizing. It's just my parts. And I think to your point is that a what you know a lot of the work that I do in education, I you know I speak at colleges and universities and work with nonprofits and dads and men, like a lot of the work is with the community, mm -hmm. um, is trying to get 
us to see that like you talked about the body parts like the breast and the ass and all that stuff so that's a thing right but then there's also the fact that a lot of times when we talk about our love for black women it's always based off of like she can cook you know she hold it down she helped me take care of my kids she helped me get my business but it's like those are all things that she does her body parts what she does but we don't have conversation about who she is what's important to her what values are hers right and so for me it's like i need you to take away the idea that this woman has to do anything for you either with her body or what she does to help you be a better man and focus on what does who is she and what makes her beautiful by virtue of like her character and her personality and her drive and her determination right and the fact that she's been through some shit and she will still lift you up her up and the others up you know what i mean and I think that's a, it's a shift. Um, you talked about this excitement or this tantalizing excitement when black men see other women. Um, I, I grew up in Minnesota, <laughs> Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, obviously my mom is a black woman, um, but I grew up in the suburbs. So from third grade all until I graduated from high school, I was in the suburbs. Um, I was always like top of my class, AP classes, all those things. And so, my immediate circle was always white women. There were never black women like peer. I never had black women peers ever. Um, when I went to college, I went to college in Fargo, North Dakota. Google that because it's white. Uh, but again, all around me was white. That's it. And so I think that for me, and I can only speak for me, my construction of what was beautiful was white women. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with the idea that you think a white woman is beautiful. But for me, it was like, I never, I never looked at black women as beautiful or desirable because I, that was never my experience. Cause I never, like, I never seen them. So I always looked at white women as like really beautiful because that's all I seen. And then of course, fetishization and being exotified, it was like that kind of attention that I would get was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm, I guess I look good. Do you know what I mean? It took me, and I'm sharing this story because it took me a lot of time to work on my anti-blackness before I realized the ways in which I viewed black women. And so I still have to say like black men, it's not there. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with thinking black, Latino women or Asian women or Indian women or Dominican or whoever is beautiful, right? It's the fact that like we shit and devalue on black women. And the reason we do that is because we have a really skewed view of what it means to be black. And we think that this, we have this idea, and I can speak for myself because this was for me, that our my proximity to whiteness equaled like success. My proximity to whiteness was about like happiness, like I arrived. So we talk about black men having white women as like trophies. And I think that we socialize our men to that because we're like, you want what's better, you know? So like you had this white woman on your arm and like things are better. And so a lot of the work that I had to do was to like, and, it, and that's and that's an effect of white supremacy, right? That like white supremacy thinks that in order for you to be as a black person successful is that you have more alignment and proximity to white supremacy. So I say all that to say, I had to work on my anti-blackness. I had to work on my uh, my homophobia and my transphobia because it was then like, well, you you know, white is closer to white is what's desirable, but then also these ideas around like masculinity and like even the size of the woman that I'm with. What does that say about me? Cause I'm, I'm, I'm a six foot man. Like I'm six foot two ten, So I'm, I'm, I'm solid. Right. But it was like, you know, she's gotta be smaller than you. She's gotta be shorter than you. And she's gotta be real feminine, like all these things. And sometimes black women don't look like that. Like that's not our sisters. Like we got all kinds of bodies, colors, and shapes. And so it just took a lot of work internally to work through before I view black women the way that I view them now. That is, um, for me, at least, that's be that's been my truth. I can't speak for a lot of other women, but that's been my truth. Mm -hmm. Just because, as a as a black trans woman, right, there is a lot of space in relationships where I'm always skating and being really thin and trying to physically and literally shrink myself. Mm -hmm. Five foot ten. And while I don't see that there aren't a lot of women my height, because the more that I move out of my dysphoria, the more I'm starting to realize that there are a lot of cis women that are like the exact same height as me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, while there are a large majority of women that are like 5'8", you know, there are a lot of us that are like right up there, 5'10", 5'11", you know, mm -hmm. even a lot of six foot sisters. And 
in relationships, oftentimes I definitely align myself with what you were saying about the idea that a lot of black men need you to be Smaller. small and shrink. They need you to not only shrink your personality and who you are, but you have to aesthetically make them feel like the big the bigger person. You have to aesthetically make them feel like there's something to protect, right? Because then that goes back into that masculinity complex. And I think a lot of the reason why Black women are seen as undesirable most of the time is because, like you said, we don't always come in those tiny packages. Mm -hmm. We don't come in these small, frail little boxes where it's just like, protect me. Like, we don't scream that. We have to actually tell Black men, I need to be protected. Mm -hmm. I don't feel safe. I need you to come and be this for me. Whereas other women of other races, it's it's assumed based on how they come packaged. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of Black men like the idea of not having to do the guesswork or not having to be told that I'm frail and I also need to be protected despite the fact that I'm 6'3". Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that I have all this body yada yada, mm -hmm. and I come off as this strong, independent Amazonian, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. even when you're not tall, but when you when you just stacked right, yeah. And so you know you you lift it a different way when you stacked right, and that is even in and of itself a turn off. Just your energy is right. a turn off. And and, so, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And to your point, I think about I literally just think about Megan the Stallion yes. in this conversation, right? Because I think. A part of the thing that was most disappointing in cis het black men's response to her was the fact that not only did this woman have to keep replaying her trauma, not only did she have to show you where she got shot, not only did she have to basically Instagram live from the hospital bed to be like, yo, but then it took all that time, like even in her Instagram live where she recounted the story, she was still trying not to cry. She was still yeah. trying to be hurt. She was still trying to touch. She kept saying, and I'm okay, and I'm okay. Like there was never a space for her to even come out of the gate weak, frail, or vulnerable. And I think the people who were the loudest in terms of being oppositional to her and just utterly disrespectful were cis had black men, yeah. right? And then on top of it, then to take up for this man who shot a woman. Like y'all really took up for Tory Lanez? Like y'all really did that? And then, you know, to look at, him and his response, like, so you, like the day or two after Breonna Taylor's verdict in which this black woman was murdered by state sanctioned violence, you decided to take shooting Megan Thee Stallion as an opportunity to release a whole album. And then y'all niggas bought it. <laughs> like, welcome to 2020, this is crazy, right? Um, and so all that to say, like a woman as tall and built and stacked and as, you know, when I think of Megan Thee Stallion, she's got energy, you know, like her confidence, her, like she, there's an energy she carries, but under all of that, she still has a body, a soul, a spirit and a mind that are worthy and deserving of good things and for someone to see and value. The problem is that because we also jump into the idea of, of cis women uh, being a part of the the, the the transphobia that we face on a daily basis as black trans women. It's one of those things where I've, I've seen exactly what you say. It, there's a bunch of trash ass men that jump on that bandwagon because it is it's the plausible thing to do with my insecurity. Because now I get to have this open display because all these other men feel the same way. And I know that this is gonna be a time where I get to hate women in public. This is gonna be a time where I get to dismantle and break down a black woman in public and nobody's gonna say anything because she's not tiny. She's not Nia Long. She's not Carrie Washington. She's not you know, one of these smaller women. Because I guarantee you, had it been a smaller or more frail black woman or had it- A Kardashian. That this could never happen to Kylie Jenner. Ever, a whole white woman could never happen to her. Never, but but it also couldn't have happened to Drea Michelle. It couldn't have happened to Kiki Palmer. It couldn't have happened to even as much as we hate the lover Azalea Banks because those women and their stature. What could have happened to Azalea? You know, it could happen to Azalea. It could have happened to her. She's a dark skin, it could louder have happened woman. To her, but there would there would not have been the guys that she she should have been able to protect herself. Mm -hmm. Nobody would have made that argument that Azalea should have been able to protect herself or that Azalea um, would have been able to beat him up. You know, like a lot of the jokes that were being made were around the idea that because of the way that Megan's body is set up, something that she has no control over, right? 
that she should have been able to manhandle the situation. And it took what, what essentially a lot of black cis het men did in this position in order to, to justify their transphobia, in order to justify their massage noir, in order to justify their hate for black women, they defeminized her. Well, she's so big and she's so this. And I mean, come on, Tori is like this little, like why, how you gonna let somebody that, like they defeminized her in order to get other people to join the bandwagon. And there are some ignorant folks that were just like, well, you know what? Y'all right. Like she is kind of big. Like I don't get- Like so is your mama, right? And you dare wouldn't let somebody do that to her. And, you and I hate, and I hate, and I hate, and I don't ever like to use proximity of, of a woman to me to, to justify me treating her with value and dignity, right? But it's like, there's never in a million years in which you would justify a nigga shooting your mama in the foot, ever. But y'all hate black women so much that you're willing to literally placate and throw, like to do the utmost of harm. And again, I think that again is a tenet of white supremacy. It's anti-blackness and white supremacy. The ways that you, you know, we don't see black women as human beings, as people that have feelings and a full range of emotions because we know because of like, you know, medicine that like, we was out here testing all these drugs and really having black women do all these surgical procedures with like no drugs, with no help, because we thought that they were going to be, you know, stronger and more brutish, you know, and those those ways that that white people and white supremacy and the construction of whiteness has um, categorized and has put white black women to a certain way as black men, we've internalized that. And that, again, is why I say so much. A lot of my work to be the person that I am now has really had to do with really working on my anti-blackness. Because for me, the white supremacy is what is under all of that, right? And the ways that I view my body, my masculinity, my my gender, the way that I show up, my, my sexuality, but also how I view black women and black femmes and black trans, like all of it, you know, because everything is so straight, uh, everything is so set on being like cis, het, male, white, dominated and your adjacency to that. Mm. So, so I want to touch on that a little bit as somebody who is very open, you know, about the way in which you show up in the world, both with your freedom to show up and, and, and exercise your masculinity, however the fuck it feels that day for you. Um, but also being able to say like, these are also things that I'm interested in. How do you navigate dating or how do you navigate intimate spaces with cis women when they know, especially if they're black, mm -hmm. that you also engage in those spaces with other people? That's a great question. I think that's a that's a that's probably the top three questions that people ask me, right? Um, so I call it coming home to myself, right? This idea, the ways that I had to work to move away aggressively from everything that was not who I was, uh, in terms of the way that I was raised, in terms of what religion did to me, in terms of the way that societal construction, what that did to me, and so in dating spaces and navigating that for me, it's a matter of like I'm I'm open. Right, like I, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and my soul knows that. Like the deepest part of myself knows that. So if I sit down with you to have dinner, or if we go on a date, there is nothing. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, whether you agree with me or not. Like I'm still worthy. I'm still dope. I'm still gonna flourish. I'm still gonna prosper. You know what I mean? Like I had to know those. I had to internalize those ideas about myself before I show up thinking that I need you to validate that for me. I don't need that. Right. So with that being said, I, I kind of, you know, sometimes I'll sit down or I've sat down and I, you know, I'm sitting with the black one. This situation happened. We were sitting, having wine um, together at this like black chocolatier. And so I was like, what's dating been like for you? You know, and she's talking about how black men are trash and whatnot. I'm like, they are. Um, <laughs> we are. Um, and so then I said, you know, my in dating guys, it's been like this for me. You know, so right there, it's like, this is what it is. And so she was like, Oh, you like niggas, you know, like, oh, you, you, oh, you like dick. And so she got like real loud with me at like at the space. And I feel like her, I feel like her doing that was a, to try to embarrass me, but also like to try to like dominate that space. And what's funny to me is I was like, are you, are you done? So I was like, Hey, check please. You know? So I paid for my wine. I paid for her wine. And then I left. And she, like, she got real loud and boisterous with me. And so she texted me a few days later and was like, yo, I talked to my girl and she said that like, I shouldn't have did you like that. Like, would you be up for another opportunity? And I was like, hell no. I was like, I'm good. And I said, because like, your homophobia is yours, it's not mine. Right. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made and my soul knows it, so I'm good. 
you know? And I think for me, you know, and then she's like, well, are you DL? And it's like, a person is literally telling you right. what the experience of dating is like with, you know, in, in dating, right. both men and women. And you're like, are you DL? Like, do you realize what that term means? Do you know what, what that means? Like, there's nothing deceptive about the way that I show up in the world, right? And I do, in part because I feel like in talking to somebody and trying to get to know someone on a dating relationship, intimate level, I'm tr I want to mirror what I, what I want back. Ex exactly. Right? Like, I want to be vulnerable and talk about my experiences and things like that because I want that from you because for me, that's how we build. Right. You know? Right. So to answer your question, it's like, I just, I'm real about who I am in my work. I'm real about how I show up. I'm real, like, I'm real. And you get to choose for you whether that works for you. But at the end of the day, like, I am fearfully, wonderfully made. I'm worthy. I'm dope. And I'm a flourish. And you don't got to be at this table. That is. <laughs> Literally, because I will leave you here. <laughs> um, but uh, that to me is really dope because you don't hear a lot of, of bisexual black men, one, opening conversation with that honesty. A yeah. lot of the times we do hear our brothers who are, who might be open, like they don't, they're not hiding the fact that they're bisexual, but in dealing with women, there's this hesitation yeah. for a while. Yeah. It's like, let me see how cool she might be. Let right. me gauge her. Let me gauge her thoughts on LGBT people. Go on two or three more dates, and then you know. And so, for that to be a thing that I think is brought up, because first and foremost, before we can date, before we can like really truly get into the intimacy part, we got to be friends. I have to want to be able to be your totally friend. right. And so, to me, what that felt like was this is an extension of my friendship. Yeah, we're on a date and there's there's an intention to possibly get, go into an intimate space. Yeah. However, this this right here is the olive branch of my friendship. Let me yeah. see if you can hold this one. Because yeah. if you can't hold this, then my intimacy, oh, child, please. Like you'll, you'll never get that. No. Yeah, you'll yeah. never get that. But I also, for me, it's very, um, and like, I don't know, for me, it's one of those things of I, my sexuality constructs, it's a part of my construction as a person, right? But I'm also a father, right? I'm also an educator and I'm also an activist. And I'm also like a, a community leader and a volunteer. Like there's all these parts that make me who I am, right? Mm -hmm. A person who loves art and aesthetics and beauty, right? And so this is just me sharing my life with you, you know? And I think that one thing that I've noticed in living here in Dallas um, is that it's just a little bit different. Like, like you said, a lot of people won't start that way, but it's like, what, is, what other way is there to be? But also for me, it's like, I want, black women to know, right? Like, yo, I see you and I value you and I want you, like, I want you to be esteemed. And I think a lot of times the fear around, and I've heard this before, like, well, you know, a man's going to give something that I can't give, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, it's a different energy. It's a different space. It's a different person, different needs. Like all of it is different. And so I would hope that in, in interactions with me that people walk away thinking like, because what's funny is, the amount of women was like, I would never date a, a bisexual man. It's like, sweetie, you already have. You know, we look at someone like an Andrew Gillum, right? Like, you don't, people are like, I would never, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, do you know, do you, as a queer man, do you know how many brothers will hit you up at three in the morning? Like, are you serious? How many brothers that got wives and kids and families and 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 girlfriends and all that stuff because they want something different? And instead of being able to, to come out, right, and say like, yo, um, I have a same gender attraction or I'm queer, or I'm bi, or I'm exploring, or I'm curious, they won't say anything. And so for me, a part of the Andrew Gillum conversation was like, what are the ways that we make relationships so complicated that someone can't share their full truth with you and then lie? Mm. But that's the only way that you'll accept them, mm. which is not intimacy. Like I'm not gonna be, that's not intimacy if I can't share with you without mm. fear of judgment. Right. And for a lot of black men who are curious by queer, same gender loving, they will never be able to broach that because they don't know what's going to happen next. There's, it's, there, there is that wormhole and that fear of the unknown that I think casts not only this dark shadow of toxic masculinity of the community, but also casts this fear, mm -hmm. um, not only for the person themselves, but also for people that they didn't come in contact with, i.e., other openly gay black men or openly bisexual black men or what we see oftentimes with black trans women um and there is a lot to be said about cis women's roles that they play mm -hmm. in that. 
-hmm. And it's been a hard conversation to have because I empathize with, with cis women, especially black cis women. I empathize with the struggle. I empathize with understanding that there's always some new Barbie doll to play with that isn't a black cis woman. Um, and that mm -hmm. doesn't include black trans women. There's always just something that seems to be better than being a black cisgender woman. Um, but I also, there is a space that black cis women have to be held accountable mm -hmm. for the ways in which they then use that pain mm -hmm. as a tool to guide black men to make certain decisions that are harmful to other people. Yeah. And I think to your point, and that this is, I, I will speak to the experiences of being a black man, that it is, in, it is entirely possible to maintain privilege in some ways and still be oppressive in others, right? So me being a black man, like uh, being, being a man, I have male privilege, right? Mm -hmm. But then also being black and queer or uh, not straight, uh, I maintain oppression in other ways. And so for me, it's like, what are the ways that I can show up to this table as a man and use my privilege for the equity and uplift of the people who don't have the same privilege that I have? And so when I think about black women, um, it's like you are intimately acquainted with oppression on multiple levels, like intersecting oppressions, right? Being black and being a woman. So then why would you use your privilege as maybe a cis woman to then oppress this trans woman? And so I think that is what, makes me think about the fact that we all have work to be done to liberate each other. Right. Like we all have to do the work in helping to liberate each other, right? Because otherwise what ends up happening is, is what good is my privilege if I only use it for myself and not for your equity and for your uplift? Like there's no point. Correct, correct. There has to be, there has to be a space where we can come together and kind of understand that there's, marginal, there's marginalization on all sides, but yeah. what we can't do is allow that to turn into violence right yes. um and allow that violence to be made okay because of the pain that i feel yes based on something that i have no control over mm -hmm. as, a, as a cis black woman you have no control over what this cis black man does with his penis or what he does and how he chooses to express his feelings right mm -hmm. but what you have control over is not weaponizing him yes based off of what you know societal sort of pressures are mm -hmm. to then become this thing that is going to then harm another person. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed is that when we call out Black cis women for instilling this, it's like, oh, y'all are always trying to make some, I don't got nothing to do with that. Like, I didn't go and pull a trigger. He did that. That's them. Make Black men accountable. And we are. But the problem is, if this Black man is triggered because he laid in the bed with you, and you said some transphobic things and you said, well, oh, can't no man that does X, Y, and Z be rolling up in here with me and blah, 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 blah. And little do you know, he's already doing these things. Little do you know, he's already ha he already has a boyfriend. He already has a trans girlfriend. And now because of the social order, there's a pressure and you don't even know, or sometimes you do, that you're putting this pressure on and now you're boiling the water. And then when the water overheats and it, and it boils out of the pot, a lot of black cis women are like, well, I didn't do it. Like I didn't actually, I didn't stab nobody. I didn't shoot anybody. And I didn't call anybody a tranny or a faggot. So I'm absolved, like deal with them. And it's like, no, but what you did was you planted the seed in him that made him feel inferior, that questioned his masculinity, that made him feel like he had to do something in order to prove to you that he was man enough. And that is a part of the violence that is inflicted upon the community that has to stop based on your own insecurities and based on your own knowledge of the power that you do hold being oppressed while also being somebody who can oppress the person in that situation and then choosing to do that. And I think to your point, and that was so real, right? Like so beautifully articulated too, is like, that's why a lot of my work centers around trauma. Mm. Um, and trauma is kind of like a sexy buzzword now, but like, you know, because we're in pandemic trauma, right? And we have racialized trauma happening and all that stuff. But like, I think my goal as a human being, as a father, especially, and as a, as a romantic partner and as a friend is like, I want to work on making sure that I'm self-aware of my trauma and that I have, that I'm continuing to access emotional intelligence so that I don't inflict that and project that on you in ways that are harmful to you. And what I mean by that is in no way am I saying that like I'm perfect or in no way am I saying that like I don't mess up. It's what I'm saying is like, it's a, it's self-awareness, right? Like I, if I do this thing, it might make them feel this way. Or like when this thing happens, it's my trigger. This really has nothing to do with you. This is my trigger and I got to work through this thing. Or if I feel 
alone and abandoned because of this thing. I want to communicate that to you so that when this thing happens, I don't misfire on you, you know? And so I think the thing that's most important in our communities in any marginalized community is that we seek to work through our trauma so that we can, instead of using our trauma as a tool to harm and do violence and oppress, that we use our trauma as a conduit to love and liberate. I'm 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 snapping on that one because it's just, I, I think that that that's exactly where we have to come from, and mm-hmm. we have to come from that that place at at all times. But mm-hmm. I think that one of the things that I have to discuss is the fact that it is hard and it's exceptionally hard to do that when we're talking about racism. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's exceptionally hard to do that. Like I I find myself being the empathy police in every other situation, even in situations where my trans sisters are like, I can't believe you are over here protecting these black cis women and they don't fuck with us. And I'm just like, girl, I get it. I know. I, I Okay, cool. But I'm, I'm still, I'm still in that place. But when it comes to racism, I am in a different space and I cannot separate those things because understanding that that racism can then lead to this hierarchy complex that can then be passed down to other people that can then be passed down to my people and the oppression that we feel today will never stop is a thing that like drives me to be like, nah, slap a racist in the face. Because (laughs) beat the ass. Beat the ass. Because it's just like you're not about to you know, not not mm-hmm. my children and not yeah. my children's children. Right. This starts with us. Mm-hmm. You know? And so how mm-hmm. what is what is your thought process or what what is your procedure um in dealing with it, you know, with the idea of trying to be an empathetic and pragmatic person when <laughs> so. it comes to racism? <laughs> Whew, Father God. I'm working, like you said, you just told me like you're working on yourself and I'm still working on me. I think professionally, you know, my work, and I I, I say this because I'm I'm all about self-reflection, but I'm I'm also, uh, I'm writing a book and a memoir around this. And it's like, I was looking at old pictures and, and articles that were written about me as like a 14 year old activist. And I've always been talking about equity and inclusion. And I've always been talking about the ways that racism impacts us. And like, why don't you see me as a person? Um, in part because of, growing up with white people always and the incessant bullying and the way that it made me feel and view myself. Um, All that to say, I think I deal with racism. I'm a lot different now in 2020, 2018, 19 than I was in say 2014 or 2012. In 2012, you would have got the Nicholas that was, because I went to um, Moody Theological Seminary in Chicago, very conservative evangelical white seminary. And so a lot of the ways that I showed up maybe as Malcolm X in undergrad was kind of like brainwashed out of me via the Bible in seminary. Like we all believe the same, like Jesus died for us all. Like, you know, like it's a sin thing and not a, a, it's a, it's not a skin thing. It's a sin thing, you know, whatever. And so I spent a lot of time always explaining racism to white people. Like this is why it hurts me. And here's charts and graphs and articles and news stories. Yo, people are married to their perspective. And I'm not going to, I will never walk in a room and allow you to make me verify and validate my humanity to you. So who I am in 2020, uh, personally, like outside of work, because in my work, it's a thing that I deal with equity and, and in proportion or disproportionality and discipline to, to students of color. And that's what my scholar, you know, my, my scholarship is on. But in terms of in my personal life, I don't make space for racism in my personal life at all. You cannot be in my personal and intimate space as a racist, you can't. There's no there's no ifs, ands, or buts. I don't have room for you. My personal intimate spaces are black as fuck. And I make no apology about that because I don't ever wanna be in spaces where I'm trying to explain how this police officer behind me made me feel. I don't wanna ever be in a space where I have to come to come to you for comfort to talk about how how I felt during work and try to like make you understand it because I've, I've lived it, I've lived it. I'm not doing that anymore. So I guess all that to say, like, you got to do what's best for you. But the one thing that you don't do with your time is give these racists the validation to think that you think that you're not worthy, that you think that you're not a whole person. I don't do I'm not doing that. Mm. So when it comes time to talk about Donald Trump and his policy and what he thinks and the news, I don't have time. Mm. I don't have time. My focus is less now on outside of my profession when I get paid to do, but in my personal life, my focus will never be on trying to get white people to see me. My focus is always on the uplift and equity of my people, period. 
done. So, and as you see, in the, and even in my social media and my writing and my speaking, unless I'm getting paid to do diversity, equity, inclusion workshops, I'm not about to explain how this feels. Why? For what? I'm going to spend my time explaining, like, this is how we heal from our trauma. And this is how we move past these generational disappointments and curses. And this is how we become our best, highest self. That's how I invest my energy. I... And it's it's crazy because I feel like my you know my my one of my finishing questions is is, is a probably maybe a tough one, um, but I've always had this conversation, especially with black men who have mixed race children, mm -hmm. and especially when those mixed race children appear to be mixed race. What is the conversation around, or is there a conversation around? the privilege that you will have because of your appearance, but the acknowledgement of who you are because of your DNA. What does that look like for you with the boys? If if you've even delved into that space yet, because they are still fairly young. They're intelligent as hell, but. Love, listen, the idea and the conversations around, like, I think that kids are obviously a lot more smart and perceptive than we sometimes give them credit. Uh, I can, I can think that my oldest son, Kingston, uh, the first situation with race that I think that he was able to articulate uh, was that he was going to school and they had the, um, the boys went to the bathroom and they had the circle sink. And in order to the water to come out, you have to put your foot on the bottom of the sink for the water to come out. So he's washing his hands. Uh, we, we, I lived in Salt Lake City, Utah at the time because of my work in the military. And he's scrubbing his hands. And this little uh, white boy was like, he didn't clean his hands. And so he like points at him. And Kingston's like, yes, I did. And Kingston like hates being accused of bad things. Like that's like, he hates it. And um, the little boy told him like, his hands are still dirty. And so he told the teacher, he didn't wash his hands. And so he created this scene because Kingston didn't wash his hands. And what the boy was trying to articulate uh, was that his skin was still brown. It wasn't that like he didn't wash his hands. It was like the dirt, the dirt, dark skin didn't come off. And K Kingston, my son is not, he's not dark skin. He's like, you know, caramel complexion, caramel complexion. Um, and so that was the first time and I think at the time he was five, we had to have the conversation around like what that means. So I'm very aware, and I think the mom and I, in terms of co-parenting, are very aware of their blackness. And I always will emphasize, like, yet, like, you know, yes, you're biracial, but socially, you were black, right? Like, if ten years from now, when there's a, a stop by the police, they're gonna see like nappy hair, thick lips, thick nose. Period. Because my, my children also, even though they're in the middle of the skin spectrum, they have the, you know, the, the features of black folks on their faces. And so it's always for me not associating our blackness with pain. It's not associating it with despair. It's like, yo, your hair is beautiful, your skin is divine, and you are dope as fuck. You know what I mean? And so a part of the affirmations that my sons, we do every day is like, I am handsome, I am strong, I'm brave, I'm worthy, I'm powerful, I'm always enough. Because what's gonna happen is the world has its own narrative around who you are to also include them being biracial and whatnot. And so a part of my job as a dad, right, is to help give them the narrative that they have and in their internal voice so that when a narrative comes that's counter to that, they say, no, that's not, my daddy didn't tell me that. That's not who I am. And so I think to your question around like, do how do you have a conversation around race? It's like we uplift the fact that they are beautiful and black and this is what it means. So it's more than just what I say, it's the magazines that are on display in the house. It's the art that's on display in the house. It's the books on the coffee table. It's the music we listen to when we eat dinner. It's the friends that I have who are all different types of black folks, right? Like, you know, the custodian, the janitor, the activist, the, the, the president of a company, right? Like that's my social circle. It's the ways that you get to go and be who you are. It's the ways that I intentionally pick this loud as fuck black barbershop so they can hear stuff. It's the stuff that we watch on Netflix, right? So we're watching a show called, uh, what is that show, uh, Tay Diggs? Something, American something. I forget what it was called, but we watch a show and we talk about what that means, right? We watch Everybody Hates Chris so that you can get these subtleties of black culture. So it's like affirming the fullness of who they are, including their blackness, because when they leave the house, I know the world does not give a fuck about them, right? And so I need to make sure that every time that they are in this house, in this space, that their blackness is affirmed. So that when they go in a space that's white, when it tells them that they're not somebody, there, when it tells them that that part of them isn't beautiful, it's like, no, that's that's not what it is at our house. I, it's the affirmation for me. 
it, it, it's, the, it's the constant affirmation and, and it's the constant fulfillment of letting them know who they are before the world gets a chance to taint that. Yes. I, I feel like if so many more young black children were getting that, mm -hmm. oh my God. Oh, 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 the places we would go. And you know? the thing, you know, I will turn, I, and I mean this, and, and hope you probably have seen this, I will turn this bitch upside down for my sons. Yeah. I will. And I've done, and I've done it. Yeah. Whether and, and for me, when ki my kids experience racism um, at the hand of a white person, not only will I call you out on it and you're going to explain what you were thinking when you decided to do that, you're also going to apologize to my child. I have the principal, the, the teacher, the, all the things. You will apologize. I don't care who you are. You will apologize. And I, the reason I'm like that with them is because I want them to see not only will I turn this bitch upside down for them, but also that you are a person. And even though you're five years old, this person wronged you and they owe you an apology and they're going to do it. And I'm going to make sure, you know what I mean? And I take that same attitude into my work as a, as a high school administrator. You know, I just talked about this in my story today. Like I witnessed uh, the way that this teacher, this white man bullied this, 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 it's your own black girl. And I, my day ended in having a whole 30 minute conversation with this teacher around like, you don't get to talk to people like that, specifically this child, because this is what it means when you do. And this is why you can't do that in the future. So how can I work with you to be more effective in how you communicate with this girl so that we don't have, because, well, she cussed me out. Well, she cussed you out because you were following her and you were antagonizing her down the hall because you had to show your power and control instead of caring about this girl's feelings. Mm. You know, so I, I, that work is like mm. in my house, but it's also like in my nine to five, because I just think that so many times our black babies think that it's normal people to treat them less than human. And it's not. It is. Oftentimes it is. And we receive that. And we, we, a lot of the time we are being told that it is our best bet and that it would be within our best interest to accept it in the moment mm -hmm. and then do away with, you know, anything else that does not mimic yes, sir, no, mm -hmm. sir. Right. Yes, ma'am. Yes. You know, and because that's all it is. All it is is it's the modern day yes, sir, no, sir. Yeah. You know, indoctrination mm -hmm. without actually having to say it. Yeah. It's the, just stay quiet. It's the it's not worth it. Home. It's not worth it. You're the bigger person. You know how these people are. It's it's those things, and it's just like, but I shouldn't have to know how these people it's are. Right. These people should be held accountable for their bad behavior. Right. 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 Thank you so much, Nick, um, for uh, just dropping off these these gems and being able to be so candid and open and transparent about things that oftentimes, one, you don't get in one person. You usually don't get all of, all of these layers <laughs> in one person, right? You usually got to go to a couple of different folks, right? But I got a boy dad, mm -hmm. a bisexual, a black man who is also indoctrinated in the school system mm -hmm. in his own blackness mm -hmm. and then also understands empathy in one show. And so thank you. For, <laughs> thank you for gracing us with all of those things and giving us your, um, your truth on these stories because I think that they're pivotal. And I wanna make sure that not only are you able to share them, but that you're able to be heard by people yeah. who definitely need to, need to understand that Black men need to be heard and listened to outside of uh, the idea of trauma response, mm -hmm. right? Don't mm -hmm. listen to Black men when they're trying to explain why they did some shit fucked up. Mm -hmm. Listen to Black men in general, right? Yeah. Um, understand that bisexual Black men exist. Yeah. Understand that Black uh, bisexuality is not a concept of your imagination. It is something that exists outside of women. Yeah. Um, and it is very possible to be that. Yeah. Um, and then also understand that black fatherhood doesn't have to show up in this way that is triggering and, and harming to your children, especially when you have sons. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, you know, and so I, I think that this this has all been really great. And I just want you to one, tell us what else you have coming up. What uh, what other amazing things can we look forward to and, and get some of your perspective on in the future? Um, thanks. Um, so the one thing that's happening right now is um, I am writing a memoir. And it's funny because uh, like in my work, podcasting, right, all the things, people are like, but how did you, like, how did you get here? <laughs> Why are you so passionate about this? Why is this so personal? Like what, what, who hurt you, bro? <laughs> like, you know? And so um, I'm working on a memoir right now. And um, 
you can go to, it's not live yet, but by the time it, it air, this uh, airs, um, my website, uh, which I will have the links for Hope to see, and you can pre-order my memoir. And so that's probably the, the biggest project that I'm working on right now. And it's been, the memoir is an opportunity for you to have an invitation into my life, the experiences that I've had, and how I took those experiences and traumas, both good and bad, and became the person that I am today. And I think a lot of times memoirs focused on like this exceptional story and you walk away like, yo, that person went through so much, I wanna be like that. No, I actually want you to walk away listening to my story as kind of a, a mirror to maybe some stuff that you've experienced in your own life, but also as a window to see things that maybe you've not seen or experienced. And then I want you to walk away with part two, which is like, what is the work that I gotta do internally to be my best healed, highest loved self? And so the memoir is both a conversation about my life and what, what happened and how I got here, but also an opportunity for you to do some self work. So that's the one thing. And then the other thing is I'm working on a, a project around masculinity, black masculinities and body image. Uh, that is a, that's a, gonna be a digital project, which is gonna be also um, featured on my website and stuff like that. So um, hope we'll have all the links, but um, I invite you guys to, to follow me and, and also like, you know, Show up in my in my in my email and say like, "Yo, this is what I'm reading and this is what I'm thinking," because I love to be able to learn stuff from experiences that are not germane to mine. I love it. We love it. We thank you. We're excited. Um, y'all make sure you all follow Nicholas. Uh, the one thing that I do have right now for those of you who are listening via the podcast, and for those of you all who get a chance to check out this video, it is at Nicholas Gaines, you all. So it'll be the at sign and then Nicholas but it's spelled Nick, N-I-C-K-O-L-A-S, right? And then mm-hmm. G-A-I-N-E-S. Mm-hmm. Um, make sure you go and follow this amazing mind. He's always posting something and I get all of my fixes. I get my comedy fixes. I get my educational fixes. I get my woke fixes. I get all of the things that I need out of one person. And I add him to the list of people that help to inspire me, keep me motivated, keep me on my toes as a young black person about what's happening mm-hmm. in the world to us. And um, I really recommend that if you don't have any of those people, or if you've been looking for some of those people, that you add this young man to the list. Um, so. so with that being said, you all, I love y'all. And like I say, this time and every time, peace, love, and hope. And we will see you on the next episode of Can We Talk with Hope to Bye, guys.